Welcome everybody. We'll begin in one minute. It's always the case that we, five minutes, 10 minutes into the workshop, people start showing up and they feel left out. So to accommodate them, hello, welcome. Hello. How are you? And if I can ask everyone to keep their microphone on mute, just so we don't have that feedback sound. Great. Okay. As you know, this is the third episode of the data, data series. The fourth one and the final one will be next week. That will be open, open discussion. So we won't have a particular, uh, there won't be slides. It's for anyone who has questions. If you have any questions that we will have an hour dedicated specifically to answer your questions. Questions regarding a career in data science, technical questions, mathematical questions, anything that has to do with the topic or for that matter, anything we've talked about uh, that we will talk about in this episode and episodes past, we will answer those in those questions. This workshop, however, is about the technologies in data science. Episode one, we talked about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence very broadly, talked about narrow AI, generalized AI, super AI. And in the subsequent workshop, we talked about uh, more specifically the different types of machine learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning even. We also talked about the uh, mathematical subjects with which you have to be familiar in order to master machine learning. Now, we will begin with an uh, introduction to the, some, of the, some of the technologies in, uh, in data science. So if you're gonna become a data scientist or if you're someone who wants to develop a team of data scientists, these are the technologies that must be part of your, let's say, ecosystem, okay? Now, if you're a beginner, you may also want to know how to go about learning to work with these tools and what are the prerequisites. That will be the learning roadmap. So I will tell you what you would need to know with respect to computer programming and what you need to know with respect to mathematics and statistics. Okay, because as, we, as we've pointed out before, data science has three pillars. Yes, the first pillar is of course, statistics and mathematics that is at the heart of data science. The second pillar, is computer programming, okay? And the third pillar, of course, is, domains, is uh, domain knowledge. So if you're someone who's been in the industry, if you've been, in, if you've, if you've been a working professional for a while, uh, at least that third pillar is taken care of. And if you're someone who's uh, you know, a young person, college, or just graduate, graduate from high school, you have the freedom to choose uh, the domain of your interest. Anyway, let's begin. Introduction to, hi hey Malik. Introduction to the technologies in the realm of data science. Now I grabbed this screenshot from our data science bootcamp. Uh, of course, this is not the entirety of the tools used. There are many, many more, but uh, for beginners, you wanna make sure you, you cover these. And if you're intermediate, of course, uh, you want to understand these in, in more depth. Let's begin with Python. I assume you know that when it comes to data science, Python is the dominant programming language. There are many programming languages in the world, over 200 of them, or about 100 of them, give or take. Every now and then a new programming language uh, comes into the picture. But well, in data science, it's really Python. The only other alternative would be uh, JavaScript, but JavaScript is still new in the when it, when it comes to data science. And the other one would be R, but R is specifically used for statistics, not machine learning, statistics. But whatever R and JavaScript can do, Python can do. Now, Python is what we call a general purpose program language. So, uh, this language was not designed for machine learning, even though now it has become 
the uh, the de facto main language of uh, machine learning and data science more generally. So with Python uh, is used for developing web servers, desktop apps, in fact, Python was created, designed for building desktop applications. Uh, Internet of Things, any smart device that is connected to the internet. Uh, tooling, we'll talk about tooling in a moment. But especially anything that has to do with data, processing data, collecting data, cleaning data, anything that has to do with data, Python is the main program language. So if you want to collect data from the internet or web scraping, in other words, Python and its libraries, libraries like scraping, data streaming. If you want to collect data from different sources, like an application or APIs or web scraping or IoT. So we have different sources of data. Again, this is what Python is used. Python in particular, a technology we call Apache Spark. What is Apache Spark? We'll talk about in a moment. And of course, machine learning. There are some important libraries related to machine learning and we will talk about that next. But first, if you're a programmer, you need to have a place, a tool in which you write code, okay? We call that an ID or integrated developer environment. It's like a panel. I'm sure you've seen it in movies. If Even if you've never uh, read a line of code, you've seen it in movies or screenshots. So you close up off the screen and you have all of these hundred lines of code, okay? But an ID is not just a place where you write your code, but it's where you can debug your code. You can open folders, you can open projects, you can. Now, Jupyter is a special type of ID. In this IDE, you can actually work with multiple programming languages at the same time. Let me, let me actually correct that. You can work with programming language and shell scripting. What is shell scripting? I'll tell you in a second. But Jupyter allows you to write code and then immediately visualize your data analysis, right? Since we're using Python for the purpose of analyzing data and then subsequently applying machine learning to make inferences from the data. And of course, we need to visualize uh, things like scatter plots, box and whisker plots, histograms, spectrograms like we are seeing in here, right? When you are performing a machine learning model, you want to see how it's performing. Some, the best way, by the way, to analyze that is visually. If you see a line going up, that means something is increasing. If the line is going down, it means it's decreasing. So it's much, much faster to uh, uh, view the data than it is to you know, make calculations in your head, okay? So the way statisticians work is they, they step back and look at, look, try to see if some patterns are obvious, okay? And then when they see a pattern that is interesting, they laser focus on that part and they begin their statistical analysis, okay? So the way we go from raw data to insight is we try to look around and see if there's anything interesting. And if, it, and if it catches our eye, we commit ourselves to that aspect. Okay. Next up, we have pandas. Anyone heard of pandas? Not the, the Chinese pandas, the, the library pandas, right? Uh, pandas is, is very crucial. Now, why? Because you see, since if since we talk about data, data comes in different forms. In particular, it will come in tabular form, like rows and columns. But in machine learning, in machine learning, we are not confined to just two-dimensional data. We, we also have three-dimensional data. Sometimes you have four-dimensional data. So you may have heard of the word tensor. A tensor is a multi-dimensional matrix. Imagine an Excel sheet, but it was three-dimensional. That's what you call a tensor. Okay, now dealing with, now, uh, I think I pointed this out in uh, our first episode, but in programming, we have two types of data structures. We have linear data structures, non-linear data structures. The linear data structures are simple to build, but it can be expensive to manipulate them. Imagine you have a row of data 
okay? When you have a row of data in, in, in computers, it's easy to add something to the end or at the beginning, okay? Imagine you have a queue of people, like at a cafe. If you say queue of people, where do you show up? You go at the end of the queue, right? Or, you know, if you're someone, uh, well, never mind that. I was, I was about to make a joke. Uh, if you're a decent person, you either go at the end of the queue. Uh, but let's say, uh, I don't know, someone who was waiting for you, someone who was reserving your spot, you would go at the front of the queue. So it's easy to go at the end or at the beginning. It's easy to go at the end of the queue or at the beginning of the queue. What is difficult is to insert yourself in the middle. Why? Because let's say you want to put yourself in position five. The person at position six must take a step back, which means the person behind you must take the, the person behind person five must take a step back and the person behind them must take a step back. So, you know, there's, it's logistically difficult. People have to spread, make way for you to insert yourself. In programming, that is also logistically difficult. But as a data scientist, you want to be doing, you will do this frequently. You will be regularly adding data, removing data from the middle of the, from the middle of the, of your, of your data set. Now, there are many computer, there are many algorithms that allow you to do this more efficiently, but Pandas abstracts away the complexity for you. Just tell Pandas what you want to do, how you want to manipulate the data, it will do it for you. If you want to turn a matrix into a vector or a column, Pandas will do it for you. If you want to go from a three-dimensional matrix to a two-dimensional matrix, Pandas will do it for you. So if you're a data scientist, in addition to mastering Python, you must master this particular library, okay? This one especially. Then there is TensorFlow. Now, there is of course scikit-learn. Uh, like I said, this, this is not, we're not, looking, we're not gonna look at all of the uh, libraries, but there are libraries like scikit-learn, PyTorch, which are for machine learning. But this library, TensorFlow, uh, encompasses all machine learning types, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement, but in especially deep learning. If you were here in episode two, you may remember this picture, this uh, diagram representing a neural network, okay? So if you, imagine, if, you've, uh, if you think about applications like uh, natural language processing, optical character recognition, uh, face detection, right? Uh, these, advanced types of narrow artificial intelligence are made possible because of neural networks. Again, if you, if, you, if you don't know what these are, you forget what they are, maybe towards the end, I can't remind you what they are. By the way, uh, building neural networks for the purpose of deep learning is not easy. TensorFlow, which is a library developed by Google, right, has uh, almost everything you need to build a neural network, okay? And in neural network, you have two main types of neural networks, two types of architectures. This is a very simplified version. But we have something called CNNs, convolutional neural networks, which are used for processing images, and recurrent neural networks, which are for processing sequences of data, like sound and text. So if you want to do, if you want to interpret text, you would use RNNs. Anyway, what I'm saying is these, these difficult architectures are, mm, like all the tools that you would need are contained within TensorFlow. Furthermore, remember we talked about Jupyter Notebook, this IDE? Google has an online version called Colab. It's basically Jupyter online, so you don't have to install it. Their tool, TensorFlow and Colab work seamlessly. So you can go, like, uh, instead of having to install this on your computer, Colab has it all there. So you just, if you know Python, if you read the documentation, you can get started with it easily. Of course, assuming you, you understand what neural networks are, right? So these are the, some of the things you would have to do. Well, actually, this does uh, represent the process of building a neural network. First, you must select the appropriate machine learning model, right? Because the machine learning model for processing image is different than the machine learning model for uh, interpreting text. The machine learning model for predicting Future quantities is different than the machine learning for classifying data. Question? Yes. Models are just the algorithms, right? 
Yeah, so I'll tell you what a model is. Really, what, what, a, what a model is, mathematically, the word model mathematics means uh, a function, but a special type of function, a function that represents something in the real world. And again, we'll come to, that, we'll come to these questions uh, at the end. So you must select the model, but then you need to build the neural network. A neural network has the following components. You have your input layer. Then you have a series of the hidden layers. You can have two, three, four, and then you finish with an output layer. So the TensorFlow allows you to build a neural network with relative ease. Assuming you know what a neural network is, you understand what layers you have to build, TensorFlow makes it easy for a programmer to build them. Then there is feature engineering, which has to do with cleaning your data. For example, if you have pictures, you cannot just take a picture as a JPEG and pass it to the model. You must first trans uh, translate it to a sequence of numbers, and then those numbers will be passed on to the model. Because you cannot, to interpret the contents of a picture, you have to compute numbers, okay? Again, TensorFlow also has the tools for that. Then, of course, there's something called train test validating. We talked about this in our previous episode. And then, of course, measuring the performance of your model. You build a model, you test it, you want to know how, uh, you want to know quantitatively how good is it. Again, TensorFlow has that library. Now, everything I talked about here is not straightforward. Even if you're a master of programming, you still have to learn the foundations of statistics and probability theory to make sense of these. And still, uh, as a programmer who does understand these concepts, it's still not the easiest library to work with. Enter Keras. Anyone heard of Keras? No one heard of Keras? Keras is like TensorFlow Lite. It basically takes all of those tools and uh, abstracts them. You just have to write less code to do the same thing. Moreover, Keras has a, uh, a set of trained models. So instead of you having to build a model to interpret images, text, sound, these are things that have been done before. People have built such networks. People have done the metric analysis. People have done train test and validation. And you can save, you can save the model so you can reuse it again and again and again. It's like building a machine once, like a, you build a machine once and then you can use it again. You don't have to build, you build it from scratch. Keras uh, makes that possible. You can take the hard work of other people and use it. So you don't have to you know, be an expert in selecting the model, building the network, feature engine, all of this stuff. But once you become more, once you become familiar with Keras, the next step would be to actually go down one level and master TensorFlow, okay? Apache Spark. I would say fewer people learn about Apache Spark. And uh, many, I would say a lot of machine learning people who've, who've, who've spent time with machine learning are not quite familiar with Apache Spark, but this is the state of the art tool. If you want to apply machine learning at scale, think, think about companies like Twitter, YouTube, Google, Instagram, you know, these companies that have large volumes of data. You need special tools to handle such, vo such volumes of data, okay? Machine learning is something. Machine learning for big data is another thing. Remember this diagram? Well, at least uh, if you were here in the previous episodes, you would remember this diagram, right? We said data science has three pillars, statistics, mathematics, computer programming, domain knowledge. And then we talked about the words machine learning and big data. We said machine learning falls under statistics and math, right? We said everything in machine learning, every concept, every terminology in machine learning comes from where? Statistics and probability theory. But we also talked about the phenomena of big data, right? And we said there are four things that describe big data. The volume of data, hundreds of gigabytes, petabytes of data, variety of data from pictures to videos to text to objects, the velocity of data, the speed at which data is being generated. Every second, how many people do you think are viewing YouTube or liking posts of cats and their food, which I 
you know, it, you, you get tired. I don't know how people watch, you know, use Instagram, but anyway, I digress. So there's a lot of data, right? And then we have data that is useful and then we have data that is garbage. And then finally we have uh, veracity, right? We want to, we want valid data. We want data, data that is factually correct, okay? So that's, that this, these four things describe big data. How do you handle How do you deal with big data? It's not straightforward. Fortunately, there is a library that makes this easy. Now to call the library is, to, is an understatement because Apache Spark is actually a collection of libraries. It's, it's the mother of libraries for big data. Now I won't show you the diagram of Apache Spark because it is complicated, but it does have it has four main modules. It has four main components, Apache Spark. Streaming in data. Like I said, there are different ways, there are different sources of data from databases to IoT, to documents, to traffic. You know, for example, you can track uh, trucks, rails, uh, trains, and ships. You can track them and they can send data in real time. Uh, smart devices, CCTV cameras, uh, ATM machines. So we have all kinds of computers and all of them produce data. And if you're an intelligence company, if you're a company who wants to uh, gain insight from all of these sources of data, uh, you need to be able to collect them, homogenize them, make, make, meaning making them uniform, and so they can process them with machine learning. Not something easy to do, but Apache Spark does it for you. But let me show you Apache Spark. Let me show you a very uh, relatively simple diagram showing you how Apache Spark is used by big companies, companies that uh, uh, have this entire architecture from the source of data all the way to machine learning and visualizing the data. Say you have vehicles, right? You want to track uh, vehicles. Now we have pictures of vehicles, but it can be anything. It can be anything. It can be laptops, smartphones, computers, uh, any refrigerators. Uh, what's that thing uh, Amazon built? You can talk to it. It's like Alexa, uh, your PlayStation, right? You have all of these different machines that produce data and send it, send it your way. And what you want to do is uh, pull them in, pull them in and read them, write them to your database. Apache Spark has a module called Kafka, which is meant, which is used for pulling in batches of data from different sources. Then there's something called Spark Streaming, okay, which will stream the data and write it onto the database. As you may notice, we have this little icon called Zookeeper. Zookeeper is an event listener. Basically, every time a device, you know, uh, publishes what we call an event, uh, Kafka is going to tell Apache Spark, hey, pull this data, pull this data. So more complicated than the way I'm putting it, but that's the idea. You then have Cassandra, which is one type of database uh, vendor. The other ones include something like MongoDB. Okay, so if you imagine an Excel sheet, Excel document, Excel workbook, but imagine one that is quite large, that would be Cassandra, except if I may, Cassandra is not a table. It's, uh, it stores data in the form of graphs. And I think we talked about uh, uh, graph data. The fact that social media apps are so fast that you can keep on scrolling infinitely and that the data just keeps on coming and coming and there's no delay whatsoever. That's because instead of using tabular data, you're using graph data. That's what Cassandra is used for, okay? And then of course you want to visualize and apply machine learning. Now it's not included here in this diagram, but Spark has a, a library called MLib, the machine learning library. Okay, but you can use that alternative. You can use that in in in, uh, in the place of something like Scikit-Learn, or TensorFlow, or PyTorch. Okay, so even machine learning is built into Apache Spark. Finally, you we talked about streaming in data. You also want to stream out data. Stream it out to where? Stream it out to your dashboard, right? So your business uh, intelligence or your data analysts can interpret the data and then they can tell the decision makers at the company or the organization what to do next. Based on all this data, this is the insight we've gathered. And then you will have your domain experts, right? 
who will look at the who will look at the answers and say that's what we need to do. Alternatively, streaming out to your customers. When you go to YouTube and YouTube says, you know, you have uh, those video thumbnails for you to watch, or you go to Spotify and Spotify customizes your music playlist, or you go to Amazon and it tells you what products to buy next, etc., etc. That is also an example of streaming out data. So in real time, what Amazon and YouTube and Instagram are doing is real time, right? They're pulling in data, machine learning in real time, and in real time also streaming it out. So it's, it's quite complicated, but at least Apache Spark uh, has the tools to build such a complex system. Okay. Now that was a quick run through of the tools. Now, let me give you a, a suggestion on how to go about learning these tools. And then we can keep the last 15, 20 minutes. So we'll make it 20 minutes to answer your questions. So we can, we can revisit the slides if you want, because obviously there's a lot of information here to grasp. If you want to become a data scientist, or if you want to hire data scientists, you need to know what skills a data scientist must, must have. And that's exactly what we're going to look into next. Look at this slide over here. If you want to become a data scientist, very important that you know these skills and you know them very well. First and foremost, data structures. Even in the coding series, which I'm not sure how many of you attended, I, I, I alluded to this. A computer scientist must be an expert of data structures. If you know 10 programming languages, you've built all kinds of applications, but you are an amateur when it comes to data structures, no one's gonna hire you. At least companies that are gonna pay you handsomely, not likely gonna hire you. In fact, when you go to interviews, when you go to Google, apply to Google or Amazon or any of these big, big name companies, the thing that they, they care about the most, more than your degree and your apps and your GitHub repository is how well you can perform with data structures, how well you know data structures. In fact, they'll actually test you. They will have a whiteboard behind them and give you a marker and say, show us how you would, let's say, uh, sort this data or what's the fastest way to find this particular value in the data? That's data structures. Anyone heard of lead code? Lead code, yeah, it's a platform where you can test your skills. When they want to interview, they actually say, go to lead code, create an account, work on that problem, show us the result. Data scientists must also be good with data structures. We had an interview in our data science bootcamp with uh, uh, one of the leading data scientists at Karim. And we asked her, what kind of skill is Karim looking for? She said, uh, mathematics, of course, she talked about the importance of mathematics, but she said data structures. That goes without saying, right? If you're a data scientist, it's more important for you to know how data structures work than computer networking, or I don't know, embedded systems. Very important. Uh, more important than what programming language you learn, more important than the libraries you learn, more important than the tools data structures. Next up, you have SQL. This is not a difficult thing to learn, but it is something you will use almost always. In your day-to-day -day life as a data scientist, you'll be using SQL frequently. It's a language that, uh, well, SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Keyword query, if you want to query, if you want to gather information from the database, use SQL. They're easy language to learn. One great place to learn is W3 Schools. So it's easy to learn, you have to use it. So that's why it's there. Next up, you have shell scripting. Now, the bulk of your time will be spent with Python, but occasionally you have to use shell. The shell, uh, if your Windows user is called the command prompt. If your Mac, it's called the terminal, okay? The shell script or shell is how you're able to talk directly to the computer. So if you want to download files, large CSVs, TSVs, or pictures, you want to unzip, zip them, split them. You will, you, you, sometimes you have to use shell script, okay? You don't have to be a master of it, but you have to know some essential shell scripting. 
This is also true for application developers, by the way. I told you about pandas, right? Data scientists, you'll be working with all kinds of data, all types of shapes and sizes. Pandas makes it easy. Now, pandas is actually built on, is actually built on top of another library called NumPy, numerical Python. NumPy is used for numerical computation. Again, it goes without saying, as a data scientist, you'll be uh, performing arithmetic on large volumes of data. If you want to calculate the mean average, you can do it with NumPy. Furthermore, when you work with TensorFlow, uh, you will come across two types of data structures, the tensor object from TensorFlow and pandas. For example, when you have a CSV file and you want to transfer it into a neural network, you must first convert the, the pandas data frame, which is one type of data structure, to a TensorFlow, to a, to a tensor. And sometimes you have to go back and forth. That is why you need to know uh, pandas and the library from which pandas were developed, NumPy. Then there is scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is uh, is used uh, is is uh, well. It's a first of all, it's platform independent, unlike TensorFlow. It's open source. And it has all types of machine learning techniques from regression to classification, clustering. This is a great place to start. If you want to build your machine learning model, start by learning scikit-learn. Great foundation for then moving on to TensorFlow, okay? In fact, scikit will have tools that will still be relevant within TensorFlow, especially when it comes to processing data. So for example, if, if, we, if we take natural language processing, for example, natural language processing means what? It means taking a sequence of characters, human language, and converting to numbers. Scikit-learn has tools that make that possible. And of course, TensorFlow, I told you what TensorFlow is for. You really, there are only two libraries for building neural networks. TensorFlow, and there's another one built by, I think a team of uh, Canadian researchers. I don't know, I don't know the name. But TensorFlow is the biggest one. You join any company with data, uh, that, uh, that has a team of data scientists, they will expect you to know TensorFlow. Take a screenshot of this. You will have to master these, especially this one, this one, and eventually this one. Okay. Now, of course, it's not a linear learning journey. It's good to try to learn a little bit of each. And there are some things in between. What they are, I'll tell you in a second. Now, that was more of a programming aspect. In order to understand, in order to make sense and to really make the most of Pandas, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, right? Like I said, you can be a master of programming, but if you do not understand what those functions are doing, if you're not able to interpret the results, let's say you write a Python script, or I can show you right now, we can go to Google together, and I can show you a Python script. And you can make sense of the code. You know what a variable is, you know what a function is, FNL statement, but you, know, but you don't know what they're trying to do. In here, in TensorFlow and in scikit-learn, what we're trying to do is statistics with programming, probability theory with programming. With NumPy and Pandas, we're trying to do a linear algebra with programming. If you do not know linear algebra, if you do not know statistics and probability theory, it's not really gonna matter that if you know Python, right? People, when they start their journey in data science, they, they, it, it starts fast, but then it starts to plateau very quickly because learning Python is easy. In our bootcamp, we teach Python in the first week. Not a problem at all. You can go to YouTube, you can learn very quickly, but we're not using Python for building applications or some basic scripts. We're using Python to use machine, to do machine learning. And machine learning, if you remember, I said another name for machine learning is what? Anyone remember? What's another name for machine learning? The original name of machine learning. Statistical learning. So why do people plateau? Because as soon as they come and encounter statistics probability theory, they can't progress. They know the Python, they don't understand the methods, so they can't progress. 
So how do you go about learning statistics and probability theory, especially if you're a beginner? Now there's a lot of topics, um, but these are really important. First and foremost, measures of dispersion. Dispersion is about the spread of data. Anyone heard of mean, median, mode, standard deviation? No, that's just uh, that's just, measures of dispersion are going to tell you how your data is your spread. Why? Why? Why is the shape? Why is the spread of data? If you look at how much data is spread, or more specific, or uh, more broadly speaking, the shape of your data. Okay, when you take your data and you plot your data, it will take on a shape. For example, we'll have the normal distribution. It will look like the bell curve, right? For most, for example, if you talk about the heights of people, okay, we have a lot of people. We have people who are like, I don't know, six inches tall, like uh, babies all the way to people who are like eight feet tall, like huge, huge, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot, lot of, uh, you know, variety, okay? I'm, I'm trying to avoid statistical terminology. <laughs> but most people, you know, like for example, you take the height of men, they're between five foot eight to six feet, six foot one, okay? And most people are in this height range, okay? That is why when you plot the height of people, you have kids and babies, but then you have adults and people. And then when you get to adults, adults are like mostly what? If they're men, five foot eight, six foot one. And women is like uh, five foot four, five foot seven, okay? Anyone taller than that, you know, is more of an outlier. They're like, you have fewer people who are like very tall or very short. So that's the bell, that's, the, that's what we call the normal distribution has a bell curve. But not all, not all uh, uh, shapes of data have this bell curve. Some are skewed, right? So they, they're like this. And they keep on going all the way to the right. You can go like that left. You also have what we call a bimodal data. So it's like it goes up and then down and then up again, like the McDonald's uh, simple. So, uh, you know, this is what, uh, trying to interpret data is very mathematically intense. Before you choose the right tool, you must know what kind of data we're looking at. What is the shape? The shape, if you can, if you can identify the shape, you can identify the tool to tackle that shape. Because many of shapes are recurring; they appear a lot. If you know the normal distribution, you go, ah, I, I know how to deal with the normal distribution. If you have the Poisson distribution, which is like it goes up and then down like that, you can. There are many. There's a lot of literature that tells you how to deal with that data. So measure the dispersion will tell you quickly what is the shape of your data. And then you can take it from there. Now, probability distribution, this is actually quite, uh, understanding probability distribution actually is where the most of the mathematics is involved. This is where you will need calculus and uh, probability theory, combinatorics, okay? Uh, but I will name two probability distributions that you must get started with. One of them is the binomial distribution. You want to write that down. And the second one, which is the most important probability distribution, is the normal distribution, also known as the Gaussian distribution. Gaussian. Gaussian. Okay. This is a big topic, but you can start with those two, like become familiar with those, at least conceptually. And then when you become more let's say mathematical literate, you can learn about the other uh, probability distributions. Then there's something called point and interval estimation. This will expose you to the mathematical uh, syntax. This is also very important for uh, regression analysis and hypothesis testing. Okay, so even though we we'll have hypothesis testing and regression analysis in this, uh, you know, in this uh, layout, a prerequisite is understanding point and interval estimation. So make it a priority to learn this, at least conceptually. Then of course, we have two big topics of inferential statistics, okay? Hypothesis testing. Now, to be fair, as a machine learning practitioner, you may not have to do hypothesis testing, okay? Uh, if you just know the terminology, you can do it with programming. Uh, but uh, if you want to become a professional data scientist, that means you, you know you have a you need to have background statistics. Okay, they will expect you to have uh, significant knowledge of statistics. 
hypothesis testing. And you need to, you know, you need to know things like uh, what the null hypothesis is, alternative hypothesis, type one error, type two error. Uh, there are some tests that you can get started with, like the uh, the Z test, the T test, the F test. I will actually start with these. You have over 100 types of tests, but you can start with these three. Okay, they call the Z test, which is based on the normal distribution. The T test also based on the normal distribution. And there's the F test based on the F distribution. In fact, many statistical tests are named after their probability distribution. If I'm giving you a lot of information, don't worry now, I don't expect you to memorize all of this, but the reason I'm going through all of these is because this is recorded and it's something you can come back and watch later. So if you forget what I need to learn next, you can come back to this video and say, ah, that's what I need to do. Then of course, regression analysis. Does this name seem familiar, right? Regression from supervised learning. If you want to make sense of supervised learning, which is a very elementary type of machine learning, you need to know regression analysis. And there's something called analysis of variance. Now this is not the last item, but once you go deeper into regression analysis, you will have to compare regression models. That is what analysis of variance is about. Once again, this will expose you to a lot of the mathematical limitation. Okay. Now, how to learn the programming, how to learn the mathematics. If you have zero background in anything I've talked about, this is how you want to start learning. When it comes to Python, and really this is the only programming language you need to learn, you must learn variables. It's the most easiest thing you can learn it out, you can figure it out in 10 minutes. From there, you will have to know the different types of data. Strings, numbers, the null data type, booleans. This is something, again, you can learn very quickly. I'll tell you about a resource where you can learn this online. Control statements, like if statements, right. while loops, for loops, especially for loops, right? Then we have a special type of data. We call the data structures. There's a special type of data. There's actually a category of them. They're called lists, sets, tuples, and dictionaries. And you need to know what these are. I'm not going to go repeat myself, but data structures are crucial. And in Python, there are four things that you can use to build a data structure. Lists, sets, tuples, and dictionaries. Okay, I think I've repeated myself here twice. What was I supposed to put there? Uh, let, me, let me delete this one. Variable, yeah, this was meant to be function, so. Functions. Functions, and then from there, you will learn the most advanced programming construct. By the way, these are all what we call programming constructs, will be the classes. Okay, because with classes, you're able to go beyond those four data structures that Python gives you. So things like a pandas data frame, or a TensorFlow tensor, these things are built with what? With classes. You want to learn those. Now, you're not if you if you if you aspire to become a data scientist, uh, you don't have to know everything about classes, because then you just now you're becoming more of a software engineer. Uh, but you just need to know the concepts. Like you need to know what a property is. Maybe make a note of that. Maybe make make a note of these terms: properties, methods, and if you want, you can add access modifiers to that. Okay, mathematics. Here's how you can get started. Descriptive statistics. This is easy to learn. No need for calculus or algebra. Things like calculate the mean average, frequency, frequency charts, frequency chart, everyone understands. They show them all the time in the news, right? This is easy to make sense of. So the, the, you, can, you, can, you can do descriptive statistics very easily. From there, you want to learn elementary probability. Now, probability is a big topic. You know, you can even be specialized in the subject in and on itself. But basic elementary, you know, like in particular, learn about discrete probability. Discrete. So you're dealing with integers. If you want to progress further to, to learn things like probability distributions, you have to learn combinatorics. Not all of combinatorics, some combinatorics. Here's two words you want to take, take note of. 
permutations and combinations with and without repetition. Again, since this is being recorded, uh, I'm not worried about you know overwhelming you. You can come back and watch this. From there, you want to learn hypothesis testing. Conceptually, hypothesis testing is not a problem. Uh, the terminology will be problematic. Uh, uh, maybe in uh, our fourth, fourth episode, I can give you a reading list, books that you can uh, read to learn this. Uh, you can learn about this topic. Then of course, regression analysis. You want to at least learn a simple linear regression model. That's a term. I think we talked about it in our previous episode. Eventually, you will uh, want to dive, uh, uh, dive deeper and start learning more about probability theory. Things like what I've listed here, probability distributions, point and interval estimation, right? And analysis of variance. This one will take the bulk of your time. Okay, like this is very mathematically, uh, this requires a lot of mathematical understanding. But binomial distribution is, is, is a good way to start your journey, okay? And it's, and it's great probability theory, you know, it goes beyond just machine learning. It's, it's, you can learn about how the world functions from financial markets, to healthcare, to banking, to sales, game. Anyone heard of game theory? You wanna know probability theory. Uh, anyone who knows probability theory, you know, uh, they can navigate their world, navigate their way around our world more effectively. You become wealthy. You will know how to make money with probability theory. Yes, you can avoid mistakes if you know probability theory. Very good. Like I promised, you have 10 minutes for questions. If necessary, we can go beyond. Any questions? Technical questions? Mathematical questions. Do you want to know anything about me? Where do I get my good looks? No, I'm kidding. Yes. Um, the, is like Cassandra, is it like the long relational database, like MySQL or something? Exactly. Uh, yeah, like MongoDB. Okay. So, it, okay. so it's part of Apache, but it's... Uh, it's part of the Apache. It's part. Not Apache. So Apache, the Apache is actually an open source community. Oh. Spark is one of those tools. There's something like Hadoop, okay? Cassandra is also from Apache. It's open source uh, and there are many tools there. But uh, Cassandra was just in the screenshot. I didn't put that there, but MongoDB is something uh, I, I prefer. In the Kony Bootcamp, we actually use MongoDB. And if you know SQL, basic SQL, you can work with it. It's not a big deal. You can, you can create an account on a MongoDB with your Google account, add data, query data, Nice and easy. Any other questions? No questions? I do have questions, but I'm structuralizing in my, in my head. Just before. top of your head. How about those in Zoom? You can turn on your microphone if you want. So how many of you have uh, aspired to become data scientists, considering yeah. becoming data scientists? Data science, one, two, three, not yet? How about you? Biomedical engineer. Yeah. Biomedical. So, what does that do? Biomedical equipment for. Uh, like people who have, uh, example, implants of their hands. Right. Need to do oh, yeah. harvesting, harvesting organs. I I, 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 I look forward to that. If you if you lose a limb, you can create one. Yeah. Even better. You know what I would like? I would like to have two extra limbs. Very good. <laughs> be very nice. If you can do that, really nice. If you learn data science, you might do it, huh? Yes. You become the cyborg. Exactly, cyborg, you know? Or if I can have extra eyes and like two here, two here, 360 view. Uh, but uh, I, I, I imagine you would know what you can actually, this is actually going to be effective. So if you want to make, uh, uh, improve the motion of a mechanical machine, uh, you would need to know statistics for that. Measurements, like for example, if you're going to manufacture uh, devices, uh, you want to make something that's compatible with the providers, the healthcare providers, and also people. If you imagine something as uh, like, like airplane seats, airplane seats have to be, actually I was gonna say airplane seats are a bad example because they're very uncomfortable. 
So I think they intentionally change the numbers so you, you feel pain in the journey. But let's see something like uh, that has really good ergonomics, like uh, like the keyboard, the keyboard on a Mac, like MacBooks and Lenovo have very good keyboards. Lenovo has like this little curve, so your fingertip always lands on the on the key, right? I mean, these small details make a difference, right? It's small details like this that make the product explode. Uh, so, for example, the how wide the how much room should you have for the trackpad for your palms to rest, right? Some people have small hands, some people have big hands, and you want to maximize the number of people who will find the laptop comfortable. So you can generalize this for biomedical engineering. That's where statistics comes in. And what's better than statistics? Statistics that's done with programming, machine learning, okay? I'm you sure- Consumption data to be able to Consumption did, oh yes, very good example. I mean, everyone wants more customers. But that's how, look, you, you mentioned how you would create a tip keyboard to facilitate for masses. Right. And so would that be based on consumption? Uh, it, will be, it will be based on people's uh, uh, biometric information. Okay. Size of hands, width of hand, length of fingers. Uh, yeah. Something we already know, something yeah. that doesn't have I don't know, bone density, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, it can go for anything. If your shoes, for example, if you're a Nike, you want to sell as many LeBron James uh, shoes as possible. Yeah. Or if you have sunglasses, right? Like Ray-Ban has, I think some Ray-Ban glasses come in three sizes. They, they have three versions so they can get as many people to buy their product. Uh, Smart watches, even the control of the PlayStation, Gaming controls, like gaming is a huge industry. And you want to get people to play games as much as possible. Uh, again, all of these are done with machine learning. I, I, I think, I don't know if I give you the example, even sports teams now are using machine learning. Basketball teams, right? They want to win championships. Like I know in the NBA, they actually hire data scientists to see how they can, how the teams can win more games. So for example, if you look at basketball games from the nineties, it used to be close to hoop. You had a lot of you had a lot of dunks. If you like Mike, like in the late 80s, you had Michael Jordan, then in the 90s, you had Vince Carter, right? It doesn't matter if you know who these are, they just would they would play very close to the ring. Now you have people who, who shoot balls from even from the half from the half court. And they prioritize shooting from the three-point line. They this is movie on this, right? hmm? they have a movie on this money ball. I think so, yeah. So why? Because now data scientists came and say, hey, if you want to increase the number of points you, you score, maybe play it, play it this way. NFL, uh, football, football as in the football you kick with your foot, right? Not with the Americans call football. So mm-hmm. Yeah, what the hell is so good, right? Uh, every aspect of life, movies, if you want to, uh, in Netflix, or if you're an e-commerce store, right? You want to maximize uh, the purchase of products. Uh, you want to know how and what to show the customer when. You would need machine learning. I mean, it's broad. I mean, there's nothing that machine learning will not touch. Healthcare is a big one. Banking is a big one. If you want to detect fraud, uh, self-driving cars, self-driving helicopters, that's actually a thing. Uh, right, so I know you. I know you do robotics is that exactly. So if you have seen, you know, like something like Boston Dynamics. Even though it's not, uh, uh, but Boston Dynamics is not really machine learning. Uh, but even 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 in that case, you know, logistics. You know how Amazon has these robots that pick packages. Yeah. So you're reducing your operational expense. That makes sense. That makes no sense? So much sense. It does make so much sense, yes. Yeah. It's like if you can predict trends within the market, uh, for example, a variable like weather, you know that uh, rain jackets wouldn't be purchased in a season where there isn't going to be any rainfall. So you exactly. can reduce output and then it's uh, the opportunity cost or exactly. yeah, yeah. Res- resources effectively. If you're a retailer, you know you want, uh, if you're a retailer, like an electronics company or, or a company that says electronics, 
you want to have the right balance of inventory uh, because if you if you stock up too much, if you buy too many in advance and you don't sell enough, well, those products are now a liability because you can't sell them. It's a financial loss. On the other hand, if you don't buy enough and you run out of stock, you're going to miss out. So when Mr. Tim Cook announces the latest iPhone, which won't be different from the previous iPhone, uh, uh, you know, you, you know that the, like there's a certain date, there's a certain part of the year where you can maximize your profit. If you buy too many, if you buy too few, you're going to, you're going to compromise yourself. Because where machine learning comes in, and people's buying uh, buying behaviors are very different. People who buy iPhones are everything from teenagers, or if they're especially spoiled, they can be like five, six years old, all the way to infinity. Exactly, right? You want to be able to segment your market. So uh, it, there's just nothing, there's nothing that you can think of and say, no, machine learning will not be relevant there. Everything can be improved with machine learning. Any questions? Yes. Go, Coach, go, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, the technology that you mentioned, Kafka. Is that used for uh, autonomicity? Autonomicity. Autonomicity. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's just for a lot. It's it's a library that makes it possible to makes link possible. in link in different sources of data. So this is this is specifically meant for different sources of data. Okay. Dealing with different sources of data. So the concept of atomicity, where would that fit within this realm? So for, for instance, I understand Cassandra is a, uh, an OLTP, possibly. MongoDB would be an OLTP, so uh, OLTP? Can yeah, you? like a transactional uh, processing data, okay. a database, of, like uh, streaming data. It's that would be Cassandra. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. but, uh, but how do you write? To the database, that's what uh, that's what Apache Spark does. Now Apache Spark, so imagine you're dealing with vo large volumes of data. Yeah. Okay. What how Apache Spark will do it? It will do it in batch processing. In batches, okay. it will pull in the data. Now you have to have a queue of these batches. So uh, that's what Kafka will do. Well, actually, no, no. Let me take it back. Apache Spark will take care of the batching and writing to the database. Zookeeper is going to trigger Apache Spark to create those batches and put those batches into the database. Kafka, however, is what you use if you have, if you have a truck or an airplane and a smart and a smart watch, and you want them all to send data to send Apache data. Spark, Kafka understands the different devices. Okay. Kafka has the code so that a truck or a CCTV camera or an ATM machine can send these data. Okay, yes. Doesn't the Hadoop ecosystem utilize all of these tools? Hadoop, there are two parts to Hadoop. There's Hadoop, and, but in particular, Hadoop is about a distributed file system. When you have a large volumes of data, not one, no one computer can store all of that. So the data has to be distributed on multiple computers. But pulling, let's say you have uh, video footage, and it just so happens this footage is actually on multiple computers. It's going to be very difficult to grab each portion of the video from each computer. What Apache, what Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS for short does, is it makes the appearance that everything is on one computer. So you can layer on top of all the computers and it's as if you're working with one, one file system, when in reality you have multiple file systems working together. I mean, have you ever heard MapReduce? Yes. That uses Apache Spark. That's within Apache Spark. Yeah. MapReduce is within Apache Spark. So I said Apache Spark has four or five modules. MapReduce is one of them. And that again has to do with uh, really it's for aggregating data. So you map multiple data and you reduce them into smaller uh, smaller units. It's a very general description. Cube data. Hmm? Cube data, multi-dimensional data. Q data. Cube. Cube data. Yeah. Um, Don't think I've heard of that. Might yeah. Any more? One more question, two more questions? Had enough? Yes. Uh, graph data? Also graph data, yes. 
graph data. Graph data is any well, graph data is anything that is not a table. So I'll show you a picture. Let's go to uh, um, let's see, graph data social media. And I'll give you an analogy. Graph. Here's a good one. Let's say we have this person on who's a user on an app in an application. Yes. And when this person created an account, they provided their first name, and last name, email, phone number, their blogs, their websites, their profile picture. If you're something like LinkedIn, even more than that, yeah, your past employers, your study credentials, certificates you have on different websites, uh, awards you've won, publications you've written. So there's a great deal of information just about that one person. But this person has connections. If you just take LinkedIn as an example, this person has connections on LinkedIn, other people she knows. We also have information about our company. Uh, your company can have an account on its, of itself. When you go to the company website, you can see how many branches they have, uh, how many job openings they have, uh, employer trends, like how many people they have recruited, how many have been let go. So let me put it to you this way. If I say, give me all the data about this person, what does that mean? Where does the data for this person start and end? Where do you draw the line? I can say, can tell me where she worked. You will say she worked at Google. Tell me more about Google. What do you want to know about, what do you know about the Google? Well, how many employers do we have? What is their uh, uh, valuation? How much revenue do you have annually? How many branches do you have? How many job openings? So you see, we've gone from this person to information about Google's history. My question is, where do we draw the line and say, this information is about this person? You really can't. You really can't. All of the, this is, all, they're all interconnected, right? So for example, uh, I want to know how many friends this person has, how many connections, professional connections she has. Well, I start traversing this network and I found that this is one person and that is worse than one person. But I want to know who are these people? Okay, but how do we, can we draw a boundary around the extent about which we know about this person? Not really. Do we just want their name or do we want their name and the company at, they work, at which they work? But how much do you want to know about the company at which they work? So my point is this, when you're browsing an account on LinkedIn, you're not gonna get everything at once. It's not possible to do that. Rather, what happens is, let me show you, let me show you another screenshot. Let's go to LinkedIn. Maybe this will help you appreciate how it works. And I will open uh, one of these LinkedIn posts. One where we can see the likes. Yes, here's a good one. This is perfect. Maybe one that has interactions. Let's see this one. Yeah, this will do. Let's say you log into your account and you see your feed and you see a feed from your friend. Yes. All you will get is their picture, maybe their username and an excerpt, not the whole thing, only an excerpt of the text they put in the post. What happens when you click on see more, that is gonna trigger the LinkedIn backend to traverse the graph a little more and bring in more data. So imagine you have a tree and the tree has branches, right? You're gonna only look at one, one branch. If you want, or want, if you want more information, you can go to the other branch and to the other branch, to the other branch. Only insofar as uh, it required. 
only as much as you need, only as much as a user asked for. I don't need to know, I don't need to see this person's uh, degrees and her 5,000 connections and the posts she made and her job history and the previous profile pictures. I didn't ask for that. I just said, see more so I can see what she posted. Then here we have the number of likes, comments, and views. I haven't yet asked for who liked it, but if I do want to know who liked it, I can click on this thumbnail and a table opens up with people with the pictures and names of people who liked it. This information about who liked came after the fact, not initially when I had my feed. So what happens is we, we went to the graph and we said, get us the profile picture of this person, the profile picture of that person, profile picture of that person and bring it back. Now, if I want to know, if I end up to you, who was the first person who liked it? Who are they? Where do they work? I click on that person's profile picture and I go on to a different page where I start traversing an entirely different graph. And we go over it again. So that's just this, I hope you, you kind of started to see what I, what, what I mean what I, when we talk about a graph data structure. Now, what does this data actually look like? It looks like this. If I type in MongoDB, which is like Cassandra, and I type in JSON, it looks like this. So we have a user, right? We have their first name, their last name, their mobile number, the city, their location. But we also want to know about their profession. Some people have one profession, some people have multiple professions. If you have one prof profession, you will have only like a string value, student, manager, sales executive. But this person has three jobs. They're in banking, they're in finance, they're a trader. It could be someone who has two jobs. They could be a researcher, but they could also be an engineering company. They can have part-time jobs. But let's say this user is a car owner. Let's say Amazon knows about this person. I don't own a car, you don't own a car. So you would not have this information about you. But this person does have information about the car. So there, this is what we call an object, by the way. Their object, the structure of the object is different than mine. Let's say even if I'm, I'm a car owner, I never share this information. But let's say now you want to know more about this Bentley model. If you were to click on it, another object would open up. This is the Bentley, this is the model, the car was made, the color, interior, machine, etc. And you want to know about the country of origin. Bentley is uh, British, right? Yeah. So, and you want to say, what's British? What's, what, tell us more about Britain. You click on UK, another object opens up. Geographic location, uh, member, member countries in the United Kingdom, the prime minister, who's the prime minister? Click on the prime minister, another object opens up. You see where I'm going with this? Like Wikipedia. Um, yes, but this is how, it, this is what the data will look like from the back end to the front. That's, uh, that is one data structure. And Python would call this a dictionary, which is why I'm saying it's so crucial for you to know data structures. If you're a data scientist and you want to, I don't know, compute some number, some quantity about this, you need to know how to read this data structure programmatically. And to do that, you need to know programming constructs. Very good, everyone. I assume you still have more questions. Maybe you won't remember them now. Maybe you don't remember them now. Or maybe your que those questions will pop up uh, later on. Now, of course, we will have our fourth and final episode on, uh, well, next Tuesday. So it's open-ended. You can ask whatever you want. You can bring the list of questions you have. I'll be here to answer them for you. In the meantime, if any questions uh, about these topics, about this bootcamp, about this workshop, or the Amsterdam uh, bootcamp, or any career-related advice that I can help you with, that's my email. But if you have questions specifically about enrolling in the bootcamp, you can reach out to Amber. I think he's out there, and that's his email. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I hope to see you in the next workshop everybody and I hear I'll hear from you soon. Take care and bye bye.